figures are very important to us. Please hold on and our program will begin shortly. The Soundcheck Podcast is coming up. Please continue to hold. up with the Soundcheck podcast and everything that's happening in the New Sounds empire, just go to newsounds.org and follow us on social media. All of the icons are in the top right corner of the page. All of our other musicians are currently playing for other customers. Please stay with us and someone will play for you in just a moment. From newsounds.org, welcome to another edition of the Soundcheck Podcast, our series of live in-studio performances, streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. I'm John Schaefer. The band called Larkin Poe makes contemporary American roots music, and since so much American music is rooted in the blues, you won't be surprised to learn that the blues is at the heart and soul of what Larkin Poe does. The group is led by the guitar-slinging sisters Rebecca and Megan Lovell, and their latest album is called Venom and Faith. And they're here today to play some songs from it, beginning with this first one called Bleach Blonde Bottle Blues. What you gonna do with them bleach plum bottle blues? <laughs> Shell paint, Cadillac, cherry cola, six pack, the pop and fizz hits you like a hammer. She is turning heads, weapon grade, legs, seen her on the big screen. Oh, got nothing on that. I said, ooh, oh, child. What you gonna do? I said, ooh, oh, child, what you got? I said, ooh, oh, child, what you gonna do with them bleach long bottle blues? How oh, you gonna ride? Take pity on me. I've been everywhere, seen everything. Now I wanna come clean. Oh, I say what I mean. I mean, ooh, ooh, what you say, what you mean. I mean, ooh, ooh, I 
girl, just say what you mean. I know, oh, child, what you gonna do with them bleach plum out of blue? That is the band Larkin Poe live here in our studio in a song called Bleach Blonde Bottle Blues. I'm reading just to make sure I, because <laughs> Rebecca, I don't know how you sing that. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm, thank you. It's, uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, Rebecca Lovell singing and playing guitar, Megan Lovell playing the slide guitar and singing, Tarka Lehman on bass, and behind our drum kit there in the corner is Kevin McGowan. So Venom and Faith is the, the new record, and, and it's full of the sound of the blues, which when I say it like that sounds like one thing, but in fact, the blues are many things, and there's lots of, it seems like you cover a lot of different styles, Megan, on this record. Yeah, I mean, we we do call ourselves roots, and we are influenced by you know blues, bluegrass, um, you know folk music, mountain music. So th- we do have a lot of influences. Mm-hmm. And and the song like the the album opens with a version of sometimes from like the '30s or '40s. Yeah. But it has a brass band sound, almost <laughs> like a marching band kind of yeah quality to Which it. Which for us, I think is is our goal ultimately to deliver to fans, you know, hopefully the the next chapter and what it means to be a Roots American band, Mm. you know, and hopefully taking people on left turns. Yeah. And then, you know, just a couple of tracks later, Honey Honey has this kind of North Mississippi uh, kind of slappy drum sound. Well, thank you. Is is that... Actually, I was inspired to use that sound because there's this amazing John Mississippi Hurt track that that I listened to and... And they had that really like present delay on the snare, and I thought it was so badass. <laughs> so I wanted to incorporate that for the for the record. Yeah. Now y- you guys grew up in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and this is, with all due respect, not the music we associate with Atlanta these days. <laughs> so how did you come to the to to listen to all these different types of Mississippi Delta, North Mississippi, Chicago blues, all the rest of it? So we're the first generation of music makers in our family, but both of our parents are big music lovers. So when we were three and four years old, we started taking classical violin and piano lessons and, mm. and played classically for a good, you know, five, ten years until we went to a bluegrass festival in our early teens. And I think that's when the idea of, of playing music recreationally really kicked in, because up to that point it had been something that we just did to be well-rounded people, you know, right, in a way. Right. But I think all throughout as well, our dad was spinning us classic rock records, you know, not only like Black Sabbath, as we discussed, to Clash and The Cure and Fleetwood Mac, and then also Allman Brothers and bands that are, you know, rooted in the blues, which we didn't, I think, necessarily associate at the time. But, right. you know, looking back, you realize that we were listening to Thin Lizzy and, you know, all these guys that were totally using the voicings and that early rock and roll stuff. That was just coming up from the blues. Right. And if, if you'd gone even further back to Cream and Yardbirds oh, and stuff like that, you know, where, you know, they, they thought they were covering long dead bluesmen. And surprise. It, uh, surprise. Skip James was still alive. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and more credit to a band like the Rolling Stones, for instance, who would come over and make conditions in order to put these blues artists at the forefront. Right. I remember there was some story about them only agreeing to play on a late night TV show if they got, I can't even remember who the artist was. It might've been Howlin' Wolf up. It was mm. Howlin' Wolf. Nice. But they were a Kobo and that was like their condition. Well, the, the story is when the Beatles first came here, Ringo Starr was amazed that all these old bluesmen weren't bigger, you know, celebrities. Mm-hmm. It's like, h- how do you not know these people? I mean, you know, th- you live in the same country as them. <laughs> we love their music. How can you not know who they are? But that's, you know, that's always, that's been the modern kind of tradition of the blues. It's something that kind of bubbles under the surface. And 
occasionally it pops up and you know Mm -hmm. bands like lark and poe come along to remind us of you know what is an essential root of of what we do um where the name lark and poe that's a family name right Mm -hmm. yeah since we are sisters we wanted to take a name um, that had some family significance to us and lark and poe is our great 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 grandfather (laughs) so what are we talking like late late 19th century or something Mm -hmm. like that so do you have a family tree? Is there like a family Bible with uh, genealogy going back generations? It's not a Bible, but yeah. We have a family genealogist. In, in, I guess we would have run across her several times at family reunions. And so we had heard the name Larkin Poe and heard stories about him. And he's actually a, a man of some like reclaim in northern Georgia, the Chickamauga battlefield. His house, the Poe family cabin, is still standing and people can go and see it today because he was a historian that, given he was living within the battlefield, actually was later consulted and and gave some historical detailings about what happened in the battle. So we've been able to stand in his home, you know, where he and his family lived. So that's just amazing to me that, you know, I know nowadays all the 23andMe stuff, you know, people send in Mm -hmm. samples and they get their genealogy but to have like a family tree like that to Mm -hmm. know who your great 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 grandfather I I would couldn't happen in my family oh we feel very lucky and and she actually found that uh, Larkin Poe was a cousin of Edgar Allan Poe (laughs) so we also love that wow so what does that make you to Edgar Allan Poe I don't think it makes us anything (laughs) I mean, Come because on. he didn't makes, have descendants, you gotta, though. You got to run with it. No, yeah. but we do. I think in terms of... Um, distant, distant, distant cousins. Yeah. yeah. But there's a, there is a bit of a derangement, I think, that can run genetically between people. And I think listening to stories about our, even more, even more closely, our great-great-grandfather, stories that our grandmother and her sisters would tell about their father, very um, tortured tortured people, very intelligent, stuck in grinding poverty, mm. and the things that, that shaped their lives and the frustrations that they experienced. You know, you can definitely feel that Southern Gothic morbidity yeah. that I think has definitely eked into our songwriting <laughs> here and there. <laughs> well, you know, the name Larkin Poe, wh- when I first saw it, I thought, well, that sounds like something out of a 19th century English folk ballad. Mm-hmm. You know, the the tale of Larkin Poe <laughs> or know. something. But it sounds like they're probably was a tale to tell yes wow all right we're speaking with uh rebecca and megan lovell they are the uh the leaders of the band lark and poe their new album is called venom and faith and uh this next song has been kicking around for a very long time yes it has um I remember Ram Jam had a, mm-hmm. like a number one the only song of theirs anybody knows <laughs> is their cover of black betty yeah Tom Jones had a big hit yes. with, with this song as well. Now, when you guys have covered otherwise familiar songs, you've done them in sort of unfamiliar ways. What have you done to Black Betty here? We actually tried to take it back a little bit more to the original format because Lead Belly wrote this tune, or he's credited to having yeah. written the tune. And he definitely had um, more of a four-on-the-floor approach, and his was a lot bouncier than I think Ram Jan's version was, and so we wanted to weave some of that back in and make a bit of a hybrid with it. Okay, let's uh, let's hear what you've done. All right. The band is Lark and Poe. They are playing tonight at the Bowery Ballroom here in Manhattan and playing for us today on this edition of the Soundcheck Podcast. <laughs>
The band is Larkin Poe, live here in our uh, New York Public Radio studios from NewSounds.org. It's the Soundcheck podcast, and that is a version of Black Betty. Uh, at least one of our Facebook viewers is asking about tunings. Now, Megan, I already asked you uh, before we went on today about your uh, steel, your pedal slide guitar, not some pedal, slide guitar, and that's an open G, right? Yeah, open G. So I, I play it like a dobro because I actually started out in dobro. And um, that instrument is about as heavy as a dobro. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which, for folks who don't know, a dobro is like a metal-clad guitar. They are heavy, heavy mm-hmm. instruments. So, uh, so this instrument uh, is, it has like a, a steel base so that you can play standing up. Yeah, it's an old Rickenbacker um, Bakelite lap steel from the 1940s. Um, and I did have this like little holder put on so I yeah. could stand and play. All right. And Rebecca, are you in an open tuning as well? I For that tune, I actually just do drop drop D. Okay. So I take my lowest E string and just tune it on down to a D. All right. Yeah. That is, for many people, the gateway drug to open tunings. It's true, which I do <laughs> love. Yeah. Now, when you guys started sort of morphing away from classical into bluegrass into roots and then getting more seriously into the blues to the point where you started covering a lot of these songs. Did you feel um, a lack of women in in blues, you know, to, to look to as kind of role models, progenitors? That's a great question. I mean, I do think that in recent years there has been a bit of a drought. But of course, we have queens like Bonnie Raitt, you know, someone who I think just slays. She's yeah. an incredible hero for us. But then even deeper back, I mean, you have, we were talking about Bessie Jones, you know, she was singing the blues. Rosetta Tharp, right. she was singing the blues, you know. And so there are these people, but I think in recent generations, of course, the music industry as a general rule is male dominated, but especially within the blues. Right. You know, all the guys coming out of Texas and Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, fire fever. Like f- for us, I think being able to, to be women at the forefront, it, it does help, I think, create a very interesting perspective to be a part of that new wave of, of women who are coming in and taking charge. <laughs> You were going to say kicking ass, weren't I you? I was, but then I was thinking about <laughs> cursing. And I did say badass earlier, so I'm already on, the, I'm already on Santa's bad list, I'm afraid. So uh, how important was it for the two of you to actually not just be writers and players, but to actually produce the, Very important. The record? Very important. We've made records with producers in the studio before. And I think being so hard-headed um, creatively, like we definitely have very defined ideas, and we found that we would be in the studio fighting with people, especially me. I have very um, strong opinions when it comes to sonic landscapes. So we decided just to go in the studio for our previous record, Peach, which we released late last year. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that we got in the studio with just the two of us and we played all the instruments and produced it ourselves. And it was such a liberating experience to finally just be able to have the, the freedom to pursue whatever ideas we wanted to as individuals. Now, you guys have done a lot of playing for other people. You've Mm -hmm. worked with Elvis Costello. Um, Was it you, Megan, who saw Rhiannon Giddens out in the hallway? I saw her. Uh, Rebecca? (laughs) Yeah. And and you guys know you've played with her as well, right? Yeah, Yeah, new basement tapes. New basement tapes. Which we were brought into because of Elvis Costello and T-Bone Burnett. Right. And so do you still do, do you enjoy doing that sort of work? Mm -hmm. Hugely. I think what we've learned over the years from artists, I mean, when you can be on the stage with an artist like Elvis Costello, who's been performing far longer than we were even the twinkle in our dad's eye looking at our ma, you know, like he is a consummate professional to to be able to share a stage with someone like that and see how they make their art. We feel very, very fortunate. We, um, We actually just got off a Keith Urban tour where we were, you know, featured guest in, in his show. Um, and that, that tour ended what? Two, two weeks, weeks ago, ago yeah. and it was um, a five or six month long tour. Yeah. And that was a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, now, speaking of tours, I mean, tonight, Bowery Ballroom, mm-hmm. you, you get like a day after today, and then you're in Europe. And, and so as you tour around in Europe, or, or even here in the States, and you look out at the audience, are you seeing your generation are you seeing my generation i mean who's the audience the contemporary audience for for blues and and roots music now i would say it definitely skews older but i think that that's changing now we look out at our audiences and we see a, a great 
variety of people, which is so cool to me. Like we see everything, young people, um, the older people. It's it's amazing to have just a moment where all different kinds of people can come together. But I do think that that is in part related to the fact that we have had some videos go viral with right. social media, that we do have more of a, of, a, of a strong social media presence. And that's due to people just sharing and being kind and, and being moved by what it is that we're bringing, finding some resonance. So I think that that is, is shifting and bringing younger people out. Right. And, mm. and the fact that a, a, you know, two women with electric guitars playing the blues can go viral is sort of a reflection of how hungry people are for things that aren't the same old, you know. Absolutely. Kittens doing cute things. <laughs> yeah, true. So, you know, the, the idea that this kind of music has been around forever and maybe it's past its sell-by date, absolutely not true. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. That's been, I think, the biggest touchstone for us in going back and learning a lot of these songs is realizing how deep the lyrics are and timeless because these are lyrics that, you know, are written well over 100 years ago, and they still right. resonate. They're talking about issues of the soul, you know, the human experience of experiencing loss and pain and frustration. And, you know, and those artists in that time period, they were suffering to create that. And now we all have, in a weird way, this ability to, to, to sort of bear into that experience as well and feel it all. And to me, that's the beauty of the blues is the longevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now, the, the piece you're going to do for us next is another one of your original tunes, yeah. Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, is this, a, you know, is this kind of a tribute to that part of the country and the, the traditional music, the roots music that you find yes. there? Yes. I mean, having grown up as bluegrass, bluegrass kids, like I was a banjo player for many years. We wanted to have something that sort of inc incorporated the feelings of, of bluegrass on the record. And, of course, the, the very nostalgic feeling of going home. And what yeah. that feels like and sort of the joy that you can feel in living and going back to the, the place where you grew up as, and spent your childhood. All right. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's once again hear Larkin Poe performing live in our studio. And this song is called Blue Ridge Mountain. <laughs>
Blue Ridge Mountains is the name of the song. Uh, took us a little bit closer to New Orleans yes. towards the end there, it seemed. Uh, once again, the band is Larkin Poe, Rebecca Lovell on voice and guitar, Megan Lovell on slide guitar and voice with Tarka Lehman on bass and Kevin McGowan behind the drum kit. Uh, Blue Ridge Mountains from the uh, the new album called Venom and Faith. And another question from Facebook from the folks who are watching us. Do you have a dream collaborator with whom you have not yet worked? Now, you mentioned Elvis Costello and Rhiannon and Giddens, T-Bone Burnett. Oh, they have Who's to... your great white whale? But... I know. It's tricky because death is a bit of an issue. Some of the people that I would want to collaborate are no longer with us. Right. Um, on this earth, um, I would say Bonnie Raitt would be a huge one for us, just to bring her up again. Um, yeah. we've, we've only met her very briefly one time, and um, we would an love to, to be able to play with her. That would be amazing. And I would say Childish Gambino. I think hmm. that would be really exciting. He is making very moving music, I think. Yeah. And you know, another Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Uh, Atlanta. Representing Atlanta. <laughs> there is a moment on the album, uh, the song Fly Like an Eagle, not the old Steve Miller song, I but know. your original <laughs> song, where there's some kind of sound there that almost has an echo of Atlanta trap music. Yes. That was the intent. I, I went ahead and programmed some 808 sounds because I love I love hip hop music and trap music coming out of Atlanta. I think it's really powerful. And being able to try and marry marry blues, we were talking, of course, about trying to marry blues and hip hop since they mm. are, of course, of the same root. You know, right. to be able to to circle them back around with each other and use those larger than life sounds. So, uh, how does it feel to be bringing you know the blues when you do go back home to Atlanta? I mean. You know, does it does it feel like it's it's part of the the musical quilt that has its place in in what's happening in contemporary the contemporary South? I would say yes, and I would say even more so. Everywhere that we go, we we feel more and more of a resurgence of people who are seeking out the substance and and the music that is historic to us as a country. You know, there is a very powerful conversation, I think, taking place mm. surrounding the blues and, and roots American music right now. And, you know, let's face it, some of those songs are just deathless. They're just mm -hmm. wonderful songs that exist 100 years on because they are that strong yes. and that yes. good. Uh, and you've covered a number of them, uh, of them uh, on this album, on the earlier records. Uh, the latest album's called Venom and Faith. Larkin Poe is playing tonight at the Bowery Ballroom. They've been playing for us here in our studio today, and this has been a ton of fun. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank you for having us. Yes. This is Soundcheck. <laughs>